really creative things that happened in North Carolina a few years ago was that uh, some mitigation bankers wanted to use dam removal as compensatory mitigation, as a way to restore streams. And this was a very uh, new thing uh, to try uh, to do. And what the Corps of Engineers Wilmington District did, I thought was a brilliant move. And they created a set of 10 success criteria and you, essentially the credits that were generated for, for the mitigation bank were a portion of which success criteria you got. So if you restored anadromous fish passage, you got 10%. If you improved water quality in some way, dissolved oxygen or something like that in the project reach, you got another 10% of the credits. And so they essentially gave this kind of an approach. And so that way the mitigation banker had to sit down and they say, all right, dam removal is good. Um, and in order, I've got to get about 50 to 60% of the project credits in order to break even. Am I really sure that I can get five or six of these success criteria? And I think that was a really powerful pushback. And they ended up doing the project, they got eight of the 10, I think, roughly. And so they were able to make a profit on it. But it, it turned into a high risk restoration for the mitigation bank to take on. And I think that that's a more realistic view of what mitigation is. It is a high risk endeavor. It is not easy to restore streams and we shouldn't treat it like it is easy. The other thing is flexibility and location. And this one really gets to be complicated because of the issue of what's called geographic service areas. And so geographic service areas essentially where is our impact and where should we allow the, the offset to be. Um, traditionally what the Corps of Engineers has required is called a watershed approach. And so they, they often want things in a fairly small watershed. So if the impact uh, is in one watershed then the, then the offset should be in that same watershed. For something like water quality or sediment, that makes a lot of sense because we want it, those benefits are really important to keep in the watershed. For something like endangered species or rare species, this makes no sense at all. Because the impacts, it's so hard to get these sensitive species back, especially endangered species, you probably are going to want the offset site to be a long way away in an area where you can have these very large sites and have source populations of those endangered species. And so thinking a little bit more creatively about where location for these offsets are going to be is going to be one of the core steps as well. The other big thing, and hopefully you've gotten it from the drumbeat that, uh, that Doug and I have been trying to pound, and that is that location matters. The lo where the project is, the surrounding conditions of the project, the condition of the watershed, I think is far more important than what is actually done in the project in terms of whether or not that project is going to be successful. And if we can get that into the psyche of evaluating these potential sites, I think that that's going to be um, a really powerful tool to keep in mind as we develop these policies. Um, the other thing is trying to think through some flexibility and approach. Uh, traditionally, uh, stream restoration has been viewed as we presented it in stream structures, uh, re-meandering the stream, and I think we need to think about what are some more creative ways that we could start to lay this thing out. Uh, dam removal is one, levee breaching is another, um, but there may be some other ways. Essentially, if we lay it out to designers and mitigation bankers and say, what we want is end result. Uh, we don't necessarily want to tell you how to get there. If you can come up with a project idea that allows us to improve water quality or species uh, or some of these other physical parameters, um, then you're going to get those benefits. One of the suggestions that was made to me was this idea of the go slow incremental approach, that essentially you get the money available to do the full on open heart surgery on an ecosystem, but then you start doing very small incremental types of approaches and you gain credits as you do, as you show the benefits of those small incremental approaches. And so uh, essentially you may, as a designer, as a mitigation banker, reach the point where you've gotten enough economic return by doing those small incremental approaches, fencing out cattle, um, doing fairly uh, low, in, uh, low intensive uh, planting or something like that, to where the costs involved of actually going in and re-meandering the stream and the economic return on that, may the motivation for that may be taken away. And so if we can try to get an idea of getting people to eat veggies instead of red beef, you know, red meat, then that's essentially what we want to try to do is create the economic and policy incentives in order to move in that direction. So just to kind of close things up, uh, in general, success of stream restoration, as we've typically done it, we can't assume it. Um, there's a substantial body of evaluation. Uh, as I was sitting here while Doug was talking, I was focusing very intensely on what he was saying, but I did check my email briefly. Um, uh, Margaret Palmer shot me an email from the East Coast and she heard that we were doing this and she sent me another review paper that they've written that essentially is coming to a very similar conclusion. That as these data are rolling in from all of these different projects around the world, what we're seeing is that stream restoration is not working quite like we thought it would. And so caution is what uh, is kind of in the air. Um, we need a, what this does, if you think about it, if compensatory mitigation doesn't work, if restoration doesn't work as well as we thought, 
compensatory mitigation becomes difficult, what that leaves us with is the two first prongs of mitigation in general, avoidance and minimization. And that, if you think about how this whole thing feeds back, if stream restoration is really difficult, in the end, if it's, if it's difficult to actually be successful, that means that stream restoration is potentially very expensive. Think about the incentive structure that that creates. If, it's if it is expensive to mitigate streams, then that means it's expensive to impact streams. And that's what we want in the end, right? Is we want it to be economically difficult to impact existing stream ecosystems. And the way that we can get there is to, be, to face the reality of stream restoration, and that is that it's very hard. Um, so uh, just some other conclusions. Uh, this paper that Doug and I wrote that kind of kickstarted a lot of this, uh, the citation is here. If you email one of us, we'd be happy to send you a PDF. Um, and with that, I think it'd be a good, uh, we have, hopefully have a few minutes at least to answer some questions that come up. Thank you, it's a very interesting presentation. Uh, the, uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar, uh, you must be familiar with the, with the Trinity River uh, Restoration Project. I mean, that has, uh, it's, it's very, you know, notorious. It has won a lot of awards. Can you shed some light on, on that project and what you think on, you know, of, of the success of, of that, uh, you know, uh, endeavor? Which project? I'm sorry? The Trinity River. You got it? Go ahead, please. Well, he just... Uh, no, the Trinity River, you know, it's, it's oh, very, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it, it, it your, your has been very... About, your, your question about Trinity River is what? It, it, I mean, it, ha it has been in the news a lot. I mean, it has won a lot of awards. You know, what, what do you think of, of how successful is that, is that, is that project? I mean, uh, given, given, the, given the number of awards that it has received. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I think it's an exciting project to tell you the truth, and, and I've, I've got some, some friends that are in the, in the Trinity River office there working on it, and uh, I have a lot of respect for them. I, I guess the, the main thing, I, my main response to you about, about that would be that that's uh, re really out of, out of league for the kind of uh, comp mit projects we're talking about. That's what I call a mega project. I mean, it's, it's a multi-million dollar long reach project on a big river. Uh, you know, the, it is true they're, they're doing some, some structural things. They're, they're coping, I think, with a, a problem of uh, extreme bed load perturbation because of impoundment and gravel mining and all this sort of thing. Um, but it, it's, it's really a, a, a step above as far as physical scale goes from, from where most comp mit projects are. So that's, that's my short answer. And the, the only thing I'd add to that is um, if the biological data shows that it works, outstanding. Then they should they should get all kinds of awards, and they should be able to. If it's a compensatory mitigation project, they should be able to sell those credits and make a lot of money. Um, if it looks good, I don't care anymore. Um, and I think that that's where we've kind of reached. Uh, one aspect of your uh, stream restoration is that you pointed out is greatly important is the the surrounding watershed health, and uh, that brings to mind then the requirement of at least requiring a measurable buffer around your project. And, and you briefly alluded to the fact that, you know, you're seeing that where there's buffers, there's, you know, additional hope for the mitigation success. Has there been uh, any detailed studies on, uh, you know, these projects that are buffered with, like you said, 30 meters or so of, of buffer versus yeah, there's, there's There's a very healthy literature as far as uh, agriculture goes on uh, buffer widths required for various functions, uh, particularly with regard to temperature, large wood loading, and uh, uh, water quality effects. Uh, again, the, the secret seems to be uh, longer, longer reaches, you know, ha have, to be, have to be treated. Um, but but that's that's a little bit of a different game than than maybe what we typically typically refer to as, as stream restoration. But there there are some good review papers out there on on buffer widths and buffer width requirements for different different functions, and and that's something that probably needs to be incorporated into into mitigation practice. And uh, just just to follow up on that, 
Greg, is, uh, I think there's a, a stream buffer project, research project going on right now, isn't there, Greg? Is that still ongoing yeah. for California? Yeah, I think, and Bill Orm, I, I want to just acknowledge that the 401 program manager, Bill Orm, is the one who asked that question, our wetlands uh, guy. So you could probably update it on what is happening with the riparian methodology. Yeah, right now we are, we are uh, working with a, a science team um, and, and Greg's group uh, actually went out and got the grant and to allow us to do this. And what we're trying to do is develop a, a tool that we can, uh, number one, measure uh, the riparian zone uh, effectively and then uh, associate that zone with beneficial uses. So uh, that's our kind of our regulatory scope. Uh, we, we look at water quality, we assign beneficial uses of the water body, and based on those beneficial uses, this tool will help us estimate how much of a buffer we would need to protect that beneficial use. So it, it's, uh, we're knee deep in analysis of, of how buffering can help us uh, uh, work towards these various water quality. Uh, then, then why did you ask me? You should have you told me. Well, I was just curious <laughs> because, uh, I mean, what we're looking at is the existing case. We're not focusing on restoration projects. But you were mentioning that, yeah, it's going to succeed better if the surrounding watershed is healthy, obviously. That, and, and so a way to pr nail that down and protect it over time, I think, would be to require a buffer. Uh, that way you've kind of got an insurance policy that the surrounding area is going to be healthy. An interesting sidelight on that business about uh, you know, watershed condition. Um, one of the uh, one of those uh, meta analyses of invertebrate studies uh, included a look at uh, the effect of of watershed condition on restoration success, and you know if 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 you were if you were taking bets, you'd almost bet that as a restorationist, you'd you'd have a pretty good chance of of having a measurable positive change in a beat up urban stream because almost anything you do is going to help. Uh, but in fact, uh, the invertebrate studies show that, that with forested watersheds, you're more likely to get a positive response to, to stream restoration. And again, it seems to go back to hydrology and water quality. So, Yeah, we have a couple of um, National Water Quality Initiative projects that we're working with USDA and um, EPA on. And one of the elements that I didn't see you address that we're having a little bit of problem with, we're working with HUC-12, um, have several within one watershed, but it's the stakeholder involvement and the cooperation that has to come from the participation of the stakeholders. Um, what mechanism do you use to uh, coerce or uh, require uh, that involvement by the sources, which would be the stakeholders? So uh, in compensatory mitigation, the banker usually has to either buy the property or buy the rights to the property, to, to use the property. So um, one of the interesting things about this is that there's a lot of interesting things about it, but usually the stakeholder is the landowner. Um, the only time that that doesn't happen is whenever um, uh, you do some restoration on public lands um, or something like that. But, but these compensatory mitigation projects are often very, in terms of location, they often are very different from the traditional stream restoration projects where you're having to cobble together multiple stakeholders. Um, the mitigation projects are usually on single large tracts of land that have multiple, you know, and often it's not the stream like we're showing. Usually these stream mitigation projects are, a, they're trying to buy a stream that has a network on that, that one because they're getting credits based on the number of linear feet of stream, right? And so if you can buy a plot of land that has multiple tributaries coming in to the single thread channel, then you're getting more linear feet out of this. Okay, the guru on this is, I'm sorry to point you out, Jay, Jay's over here, um, he's got a beard and he looks like he's from Berkeley, I guess, uh, but he's actually from Duke, so he's, he's okay. Um, but uh, Jay's been doing a lot of work on where these projects are actually located and how they're structured and how the landowner actually affects a lot of these things. I actually don't know people from Berkeley, I've, I've just heard stories, so I don't know. Um, but it's a little bit different than the traditional approach. So. Whoever has a microphone. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is related to the metrics you are using to determine improvement of benthic macroinvertebrate communities. And generally, the metrics that I saw up there 
are not really the best ones to use because if you're looking at tax or richness and you're looking at abundance density values, those change radically and they're not really very representative of the types of bugs you want to return to a stream. Uh, you could have a stream with high tax or richness, but it's loaded with tolerant organisms. And because of that, the, the quality of the community then is highly degraded. So it's really the composition of the community, uh, the percentage of intolerant species that you're really looking for because that really is a direct connection to the uh, condition of the stream. Yeah, I, I think what, what you saw was a, a rapid way to, to cut to the chase of the findings. The, the, the studies that were reviewed by those, those two meta-analyses were, were pretty rigorous and, and, and they did look at the, the normal range of, of indices and so forth. So I, I would refer you to the original references on that. Um, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I think there's a little bit of a cold water bias in what you're saying about, about richness and diversity, but we, 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 won't, we won't hold that against you. In reference uh, to Salmon uh, yeah, primarily. Yeah. But uh, I, I, th I think that that was a, uh, you know, a, a nice overview at 10,000 feet. I think if you drill down a little bit closer, you'd see they were. I have a question. I have a question. Um, you mentioned um, monitoring in stream structures and if it's really making a difference or if it, the fish are just all congregating in the new structure. Um, how long do you think that monitoring should happen for invertebrates and fish? Because in endangered and threatened species, the numbers are so low that it'll take years and generations maybe before we see any difference. So I don't know how many years of monitoring the studies that you referenced were, um, but that's my question. Thanks. So one thing that uh, you're totally right, uh, the North Carolina stream mitigation ha used to be five years of monitoring required. They've just pushed it up to seven years of monitoring to try to capture more of that. Um, whether or not that's long enough is an open question, but you do have this tension that we want it longer to make sure that we're getting the real ecological response, but mitigation bankers make their money based on, uh, they want to get their money sooner than seven years. Um, and so there's going to be a push-pull between the economics and the ecology. There, there, really, there are really two questions here. One is, is how long do you do you monitor? And the, and the second is, um, what about threatened and endangered species as indices? And I, I don't think rare species are, are really good uh, indices of, of success because they, they are so rare. Um, so I, that's, that's your answer there. I, e even though they may be targeted and in, in individual, uh, you know, species of, of concern, I think if we can select a um, certainly a, a, a native uh, a suite of native species that that that's a much uh, surer foundation for us to see exactly what's going on. As as far as uh, monitoring goes, you know, I, my background is in, in research, and you 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 never get enough data. Uh, but but being realistic, I, I think if we get you know three to five years, that's that's real good. I will say this though. Martin uh, talked about the go slow incremental approach where you, you get the, the, the full uh, slug of money and then instead of doing as he referred to it, the open heart surgery on the ecosystem, you, you just do uh, an increment and, and observe response. Well, this, this requires you monitor all along the way as you nudge the ecosystem in the direction that, that you want it to go. So, so that would be a case where the, the monitoring is not an add-on to the project. Really, the monitoring is the project because you're you're incrementing your adjustment and then watching to see to see what happens. Can can I just add to that, Dr. Shields and Dr. Doyle? Um, there was some fantastic research done. Oh, there's there's been a lot of research done, but one I particularly remember was uh, by a, a gentleman called Steve Clayton um, at the University of Idaho in Boise, and uh, it was a while ago now, but um, he he um, did some reviews of monitoring studies and generally in terms of uh, physical processes you can see a statistically significant change as a result of uh, you know rehabilitation project 
in a much shorter period of time. Obviously, it's hydrology dependent, what flows you get, etc., how, how much sediment, uh, sediment moving events you get and things like that. But you can see statistically significant change within three to five years in, f in terms of physical parameters. But obviously, biological uh, parameters, as you, as you mentioned, um, you need a substantially larger time period of monitoring. Uh, there's so much more greater statistical fluctuation in terms of the biolog biology. And what Steve Clayton found in his re research was that it could be you know, in excess of 10, 20, 30 years of, of, of data, depending on the species characteristics, before you saw a statistically significant change. So if you, physical parameters, when I, when I say physical parameters, I'm talking about cross-sectional geometry, sediment, you know, bars, gravels, uh, velocities, any, anything physical is much easier to monitor in a much shorter period of time, but biological constituents is dramatically longer to period of time. So I had a question about the location. You talked about um, you know, a lot of it depends on where it's located. And s going to mitigation banking here in California, a lot of the impacts are happening in the Central Valley, areas where it's very impaired, the watershed is not not the best, I'm talking about urban or agriculture. And then to get out of that, you'd have to go up into the foothills, up into the forested areas, even sometimes all the way up into the national forest, miles and miles away, to be able to reach what it appears that you've been talking about with these slightly impacted forested areas. Would it then be appropriate to have banks in those areas and then have mitigation bank service areas reach all the way down through the valley? Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> it, that is a policy decision to be made probably by somebody at a higher level than my pay grade. Um, essentially, you, the, the, the policy decision needs to be what have we, what do we want out of this overall approach? So, if we want water quality improvement, and we can figure out a way to engineer streams to do that, then those need to be local. If uh, as a state, as a, as a policy, we've decided that we have lost an inordinate amount of habitat to cold water salmonids or to warm water species as well, then either you have to create the right uh, policy and economic incentive structure to get large sites in the middle of the valley, which may or may not be reasonable to expect, um, or you have to be willing to accept projects that will be distant from the impacts. And that, that's, but you can't have, you cannot expect high functioning projects in the middle of a highly developed area. And, and start with that as your starting expectation point, and then make some series of decisions out of that. Is that good enough of an answer? Okay. Actually, my Could question was similar. Let me just uh, jump in here and say that um, one of Martin's concepts that he, he touched on briefly and it is in, in the paper is that different mitigation projects might yield credits in different areas, a, a, as he just mentioned. Uh, you might have one location that'll, that'll be good for, for water quality credits. If you're trying to provide, you know, T&E habitat, you may need to be in a more, more pristine location. And so we don't expect all projects to be all things to all men or women for that case but anyway you get the point yeah i think that's i think the point that they've made in the paper about flexibility on location is is really really important because in certain areas as you mentioned or intimated that um, you in certain areas of the valley we've gone past a threshold both a geomorphic threshold and a biological threshold it's almost we, it's too late in some places, which is rather depressing to say. That's not to say that we can't rehabilitate. I'm all for rehabilitation everywhere, but we should, we should recognize that in certain areas that re rehabilitation isn't going to achieve the, the biological goals that we would all dream of. So let's, let's invest the money to get the biggest bang for the buck, which means uh, um, flexibility on, on location and spend that money where we'll get the biggest bang for the bu biological book. Okay, so a little, uh, little order of speaking. We got Alexa, we got a woman in the back, and then we got over here Bill and then Chris, or Vicky and then Chris, because she outranked you, Chris, sorry. Actually, my question was very similar to the previous one in the sense that 
you know, there's many areas in California that either are severely urbanized, so rehabilitation may be the only option, or um, they're already rather pristine, um, and so there's not, they, they, don't, they don't present a viable mitigation site. And so these, I, I hate to think that certain um, these short, small sections of a already degraded watershed are hopeless, but I'm wondering if, if perhaps they could be targeted as, you know, many people, many, many projects could be mitigated in different sections along the watershed and then, you know, in ultimately restore the entire watershed. I don't know if you guys have thought of that in terms of perhaps a way to Yeah, yes. I, I mean, that's the ideal, and that's what we've been trying to get towards in North Carolina, that we can start piecing these things together. The problem is, as Doug said, time isn't on our side. Mm -hmm. It's more likely that we won't have access to those sites in between than that we will have access. Now, just to get kind of piece these two together, you know, you got to think through the whole cycle. So if a mitigation banker is able to cobble together in the middle of a highly developed area, a long enough reach that they can show provides maybe not all the benefits, but maybe some uh, temperature benefits, some water quality benefits. They, ha they, it's probably going to be expensive, and they have to be able to profit from that. If, if you've got the one project in the middle of a very densely populated area that actually works, then the policy mechanism needs to be there that they can recover those expenses. And I think that that's what is really frustrating to watch in. The, in as we, we tweak these policies and try to do different things with them, you can undermine the projects that are really ambitious and really entrepreneurial, and that's, you have to keep an eye on that, that that, that becomes really, um, there's a lot of moving parts in this whole thing. Land development is not going to stop, and so to expect these things to be more opportune down the road, I don't, I don't know that I can buy that one yet. But I, and I do recognize that the way it sounds is that we should give up on certain watersheds, and we need, I don't know the answer, but we don't have a solution to that problem with this policy. And, so. I, and I don't think we should, absolutely, and I didn't mean to infer that you know, some places are hopeless. You know, and, and sort of I, I did indicate that I think we can always do something, but just uh, set our levels of expectations to a certain point. We can make, we can make uh, rivers uh, or streams behave much better geomorphically and more naturally but we might not get the biological response. That that's that was my, my con that's always my concern that we expect too much and uh, we, we we can't create miracles, but we can do a lot of good. Could um, the physical portion be a precursor consideration for credit, given a bank might want to invest and then wait 15 years for the biological measurement to reveal itself? And secondly. The emphasis I get on biological and chemical, but would you completely disregard some of the physical measurements, such as groundwater levels being raised, as also a measurement of success? Okay, so I have a cynical view on this. Um, <laughs> hey, uh, you could. I mean, one of the easiest, one of the, you know, maybe one of the things that you say is that uh, we want chemical, physical, biological integrity improved in some way, and you get 33 percent for each one. So you can restore, if you can restore something about the physical integrity, we'll give you 33% of the credits of that project. If you can get chemical, we'll give you another 33, something like that. Um, as a, somebody interested in the function, you know, the goal is no net loss of ecosystem function, or no net loss of stream function. Um, the morphology of a stream does not help. We, um, environmentally, we don't get anything out of that. It looks right. It may change groundwater, but if the groundwater isn't tied to something that we're interested in um, ecologically, then we can't say that that's a surrogate for ecology. We might as well measure the ecology. So I, I'm, I've seen so many projects that are successful physically that don't succeed biologically or chemically that I, I, I'm a little bit hesitant. He may be more optimistic. Uh, well, you know, I don't know how Martin got to be so uh, cynical. You know, when he was working on his graduate degree, I treated him real nice, so I don't know what happened to him. But anyway, uh, the Clean Water Act, you know, the Clean Water Act says we're supposed to maintain the biological and chemical integrity of the waters of the United States. I'm just saying what he just said. 
So uh, if, if, you know, we, we just, you know, f physical's, physical's nice, but I, I think we, we can skin that cat. It's these others that we're falling short on, and we need to make economic reality reflect that. <coughs> Yes, one, one thing um, you mentioned was, boy, if only we could, uh, you know, aggregate these projects together, then maybe we would see some uh, positive effects more quickly. And we have actually started to do that uh, in a regulatory sense here in California uh, by trying to uh, permit uh, habitat conservation plans. Uh, now, habitat conservation plants have always been out there for habitat, uh, but now uh, the Corps and ourselves have become interested in, okay, can we uh, permit these and use them essentially as in-lieu fee providers for water quality? And, and, and it's been a, you know, a, a big learning curve, especially for the HCP providers, the cities and counties, who are used to only having to cough up benefits for habitat, we're asking them now to consider, okay, uh, we need some projects where you're improving water quality in this watershed plan area. And because we see great promise in the, the uh, you know, advantage of, like you were saying, take a watershed area and focus, you know, your projects in this watershed where you can aggregate and achieve some measurable success rather than you know, even those far outstrip the size of a typical mitigation bank in terms of size. So th there's some promise there, we think. Um, I'll just uh, I'll just tell you that I, uh, based on experience and based on ideology, I am very opposed in Luffy programs. Um, and I would encourage you to look at North Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, um, the, the states that have created in lieu, an in-lieu fee program and the level of success or lack thereof that they've had. And what I've found in in-lieu fee programs is each decision and each planning decision in isolation makes all the sense. And it, it, it's, you know, everybody's marching along and five years later you don't know what just happened. That the, a series of incentive structures have been created and a series of decisions have been made that have undermined the overall program. And I, it's, it's a lot of detail, but, um, and I've written way too much on it. Um, but I'll just say that, uh, be, you know, uh, be thou very cautious uh, from here on. So, can I just ask, so, so with, all, with all everything you've written, Martin, is there, is there information out there, or uh, do you have advice on how uh, mitigation, uh, are you just flatly, outright opposed to in lieu fee programs how would you generate the revenue to do the stream mitigate uh, the stream restoration if without in low uh, in lieu do you have other vehicles that you um, would recommend the the main all right so ideologically the problem that i have with the, um with in lieu fee programs is similar to economic discounting that it's a promise that you will deliver the commodity in the future and ecologically what it is is i'm going to impact now and i'm going to give some entity to fee and they're making a promise that they will eventually deliver that ecological good. And what that means is that there's a window of time in which the environment has been degraded and the restoration is promised in the future. So that's fine. Uh, economic discount factors exist. And essentially, you know, if, if you, you know, you giving me $10 now is worth $10. You know, you saying that you'll give me $10, you know, three years from now, I'm like, well, I'd rather have the $10 now, but if you want to give me $300 three years from now, then we might be good. And we need to do the same thing ecologically. The promise of, e of environmental credits in the future are not worth as much, which means we need, we need more of them whenever they're actually delivered. Whether we do that with a trading ratio or whatever, that's fine. The other problem that I have with it is in the traditional mitigation banking vision, the, I liked the way the liability was moving around. With an in-lieu fee program, especially if the state is accepting the fees and then they're in charge of uh, providing the, the credits down the road, the state has just absorbed all of the liability. They've accepted all of the risk to provide those offsets and, and the things that go along with that. And uh, as these states, Tennessee, Virginia, North Carolina, as their in-lieu fee programs have gone bankrupt, 
what we've seen is that the state has absorbed risk that could have been left in private industry hands. Um, and as a knee-jerk reaction, that, that's what I've seen. Yeah, that's not the way it's structured here. Uh, the way it's structured here is, is that uh, the in lieu fee uh, program provides, just like a bank, in fact, it's structured just like a bank, where the, the project must provide the project uh, that's examined by a, an interagency review team, an IRT. They uh, decide on how many credit, the credit release based on the project. Uh, the project gets initiated, the credits get generated. At that point, there's a trade. It, it becomes a trade. Right, so, so. The state, so the state would be working essentially like a bank, an advanced bank, so they're not it's having exactly advanced credits. Then that very similar to a bank. It's if a not exactly the same. Right. So that's 99% of the way there. The only thing, the 1% onto that, I would say, is the why does the state need to do that? Uh, these habitat conservation plans are, are developed by usually cities and counties. Uh, or why, also do, why, does the, why does the government? I, okay. Well, let, let's What's the question? <laughs> well, um, the way the 2008 federal rule is said is that in-lieu fee programs have to be by a nonprofit or by a government entity. Um, uh -huh. And there are some advantages that are given to them in the, in the policy structure. And I, it has not been clear to me why private mitigation banks are not provided the same opportunity that we're, the government entities are provided. No, we're not saying no to the private banks getting started and reviewed and approved. In fact, we're encouraging that. But we're also uh, looking at uh, this other vehicle in Luffy programs as a, another mechanism uh, that will allow, uh, yep. you know, more mitigation to be provided. Right. So yep. it's just just another uh, tool in the tool bag for yep. mitigation. The only problem that we've seen there in North Carolina is that they then become competition to the private banks, and you have a harder time getting private banks to move into the area. Um, and so they essentially potentially can drive private banking out of business. So there's, this is, you know, you're now my good friend. We should talk a lot. So. All right. So. I got Vicky, I got Chris in the back, I got two questions online. One has partially been addressed, but let's keep going. Well, I was hoping to answer this question while one of our board members was here, but he just left, because he's the guy who gets to vote out of everybody in the room on a lot of this stuff. Um, but my question is, you know, the State Water Board has um, authority to implement the Clean Water Act. Um, because we're an in lieu program under the Clean Water Act, but we also have um, independent water rights authority, unlike most of the other states where the folks who are implementing the Clean Water Act are separated from the people who are making the water supply decisions. So we have um, pretty broad authority, including authority to um, increase flows in streams um, through water right actions. Um, we're spending a tremendous amount of effort as a state and as an organization um, trying to improve conditions in the Bay Delta, which is severely impacted. Um, we've got one group of folks who are uh, trying to set biological um, objectives in various places in the state, and, and um, the approach that they're taking is setting reference water bodies that they'll use to compare um, other places to these reference sites. We can't even find any reference sites in the Central Valley. Um, we've got a bunch of rim reservoirs who have blocked 95% of the habitat for salmonids. And, you know, to be honest, one of our efforts is to restore salmonids in California, along with our partners at, um, at Fish and Game. So we're trying to recreate those salmonid habitats below these rim reservoirs where the stream conditions are vastly different. You know, you look at the San Joaquin River where we're spending tremendous amounts of money and there's a bypass, a flood bypass, and then there's the natural channel. The flood bypass is half a mile wide and there's no trees. The natural channel, you can step over and it's green and slimy. Um, I can't imagine a, a cold water fish living in either of those habitats, to be perfectly honest. Um, you had talked about, so now I'll get to my question. You had talked um, about some of the, you know, some of the watersheds just being too far um, past uh, salvation. Do you think that there's anything that we can do as a state recognizing both our water quality and our water rights authorities um, to improve conditions in the Delta, at least for salmon? I recognize that there are other beneficial uses that we could potentially improve. And um, given that, and given that, that, um, that dams are blocking both fish passage and gravel recruitment, 
and large woody debris and things like that. Um, do you think that improving flow is um, actually going to be beneficial to the to the lower areas? And um, you had mentioned that you know taking dams out doesn't always have the the benefits that people um, expect. Um, do you think we're tilting at windmills um, if we look at things like taking taking out dams? Um, all right, you're way outside my wheelhouse now. <laughs> so. Um, the only pro all right, I'm going to be the projects that have been the most successful in North Carolina have been dam removal projects. Um, they have been the least cost, most geographically and ecologically profoundly successful projects. You know, full stop. Um, these are small dams. You know, you, you guys, you get, yeah, you, you're kind of. We have a lot of small dams on the coast. So all right, so you got that going for you. Um, the so dam removal. Um, let me be clear, it provided a lot more benefits than any other stream restoration project in North Carolina. Um, it didn't provide some of the benefits that they were hoping on a project by project basis, but it provided, it dwarfed the success of other projects. Um, the whole Delta thing, yeah, I'm not going to touch that, sorry. Water is a wonderful thing. So uh, you, you know, I, I think I think it's uh, it is important to understand that we're, we're not railing against the practice of, of stream restoration. You know, I'm not against oncology. Uh, I I just hope that they get a lot better. You know, and and I you know this this is uh, you know I, I I'm in love with stream restoration. It, it you know I love to think about it every day all day. But uh, let let's let's be frank about what we can do for folks and what we can't do for folks and in the comp compensatory mitigation thing I'm saying I'll take this away from you and and look what I'm going to give you and it's kind of a shell game that, that's all we're saying we're not saying let's give up and quit trying so I know I, and I don't know what what the answer is about the Delta and and uh, you know the San Joaquin and all these other things. But um, what it, you know, and flow. Now, now and this flow, guy right here, though, you can pay him, and he can tell you. No, 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 no. <laughs> now I just, but Doug, can I, can one of you talk about flow yeah. augmentation? I think that's such a hot so topic I, in I think California. That, that one's one that actually, when I'm saying that incremental approach, I think that that's a great example of don't get into the stream. What you know, can we actually by increasing the flow, you know, by X amount, if we start to get some of these ecological, you know gains that we traditionally associate with, you know, breaking the stream open and doing it, then that should count in some way as stream restoration. That's what I mean by tell me what the goals are and then say however you get there, you know, go for it. But um, what we're saying is getting bulldozers in the stream is probably not going to get you the goals that you thought you were going to get. All right. I'm going to keep us moving. Chris, oh, well, Chris, do you have a microphone? I'm going to. Oh, you're good. Okay. Sorry. Uh, thanks. Forward. This conversation is highlighting to me that for streams, for determining impacts and adequate mitigation, that spatial units of measurement are pretty inadequate, linear feet and acres. It assumes that every stream is the same. Yeah, I, I think one of the take homes is that there's a nonlinear relationship between uh, the um, size of a restoration project and ecological response. That as as that as as we bundle things together, as we as we work in in longer reaches and larger areas, that our uh, ecological response goes up in a in a nonlinear fashion, and and so the the bigger payday is in large projects where we take large actions, and so the foot for foot, or the the linear trading factor uh, sort sort of thing is is not really reflecting what we can do. <coughs> And I think some of the states that you look at probably, or I know some of them have procedures and functional assessment methods that are used for determining the amount of mitigation that's required and how many. They use a functional credit rather than a linear foot credit or an right. acre credit. Did you look at how any of those different functional assessment methods when used to drive restoration affected the results of that restoration? Great question. Um, it's We're on the verge of it. Um, the. The, pro the state that probably is thinking the hardest, the two of them, Oregon's doing a pretty good job. They're really getting into it, and they're probably the one for you all to look at because they have the anadromous fish issue, and so they're, they're going after it pretty hard. Ohio is doing a, they're, 
they kind of started over. They, they took the foot for foot thing and they said, all right, this, this isn't just like what you said. This isn't what we're supposed to be talking about. Um, and so they have a different way of inventorying and essentially balancing their books of impacts and, and offset and impacts and restoration. And I'd encourage you to look at the Ohio um, Department of Natural Resources, I think, the way that they actually do it. Um, those are the two states that are playing with, but a lot of states are in the game right now of trying to figure out functional assessment. Um, how are we going to inventory these different credits? But I agree that the foot for foot thing, a lot gets lost when we, we, we call it a loaf of bread and we start passing it around. Okay, I have one question online that is probably still unanswered, and so I'll read it. It's from Kelly Barker, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, or California, sorry. <laughs> um, same thing. No, um, a lot of focus in the Central Valley is on restoring natural river processes. We realize this is difficult in such an altered system, but it's essential for our ecosystem function. Have you had any success in removing revetment to allow erosion on alluvial streams, and how did you get through the permitting and potential liability issues? No, I've I've never uh, I've never done revetment removal project. Um, I think Dr. Doyle is pretty uh, daring in the in the dam removal department. But in in the mitigation paper uh, section that that he contributed, we we talk about infrastructure retirement as being an avenue that that we need to look at ever more strongly, and that involves dam removal and levee breaching and removal of, of revetment and so forth um, a good good luck with the liability issues and and so forth there are some groundbreaking geomorphic models of lateral channel migration and there is e excitement in literature this is this is really highbrow stuff there's hydraulic property uh, hydraulic processes geotechnical processes involved it's 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 a, a difficult thing um, but there are some some very good scientists out there that are they're working on that that problem. So th that's that's the that's the full file of all I've got. I, I think it's a great idea, but I'm yeah. I'm sorry. Um, just briefly on it, I doubt that it would be possible. My gut sense, if I were a private mitigation banker, um, that would be a high risk thing to do. Um, mainly because you've got to you have to generate revenue in five to seven years um, and you're counting on the revetment revo removal causing geomorphic changes that will then cascade into these water quality or ecological benefits um, and if i'm a mitigation banker that's a pre that's a series of steps that i have to have faith are going to happen in order to get an economic return so that's probably something that would need to be financed and run through a more traditional stream restoration kind of approach rather than compensatory mitigation. Mitigation isn't going to provide the economic incentives necessary to do some of the restoration, the types of restoration that we eventually need to do. That might be one of them. So I have one more question, um, and then we sh we're about 20 minutes over time here, but I'll see if you know, they'll probably stick around and answer your individual questions. Um, you, you mentioned the economic uh, driver of uh, mitigation not being the ideal or compensatory mitigation. It should be your last choice, and you you, you mentioned that it should be more expensive or it should, be, it should drive it. And uh, I think another way for us and our regulatory ease to think about that is the avoided cost of compliance of uh, actually avoiding the m impact in the first place. And so in your experience in, in other states and, and looking at this uh, tip of the spear, have you seen um, sort of a, a refinement of the economics of what it actually is? Instead of just getting expensive, is it getting to be a better reflection of the resource costs? No. Uh, happen in what in there's a uh, person Morgan Robertson is at the University of Wisconsin and he looked at this effect for wetlands around Chicago and uh, I think and he's gonna shoot me later but I think that they got up to around hundred and forty thousand dollars per acre for a credit or for a credit in compared to about twenty thousand was the typical going rate in small in the urban developed area and that you know now you're starting to talk about okay that's gonna affect my land development decision um, and not to just bang again on in-lieu fee programs, but when an in-lieu fee program exists, there, there's always, there's an amount to be paid. Um, and so that usually is an out for developers. Essentially what you want is the price to be really big so that you only get avoidance and minimization. Um, and I haven't seen that work in North Carolina, Georgia, South Carolina, and these other states because an in-lieu fee program came in um, and that always provided a floor um, to fall back on. And I don't, I don't know how to square that circle, but that's, um, and to be very blunt, the fees set in in-lieu fee program are set in North Carolina by the legislature. 
and there's a powerful group called the Home Builders Association that lobbies very effectively to keep those rates reasonable. Um, so, yeah, I've never well, thank seen. Thank goodness we don't have that here. Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah, <laughs> just just flying into the airport, I thought, wow, they don't they probably don't have a Home Builders Association. Um, all right, I'll I'll allow one more because you flew in all the way from North Carolina. Moved out here recently, oh. but um, I had to move my car when you guys were concluding, so I don't know if I missed um, part of this in your conclusion, but I think one important take home from North Carolina is, is that they've built a system that is now very static and can't, um, there's no kind of dynamic capacity left to make decisions later on to change the way that they actually are grading the ecological benefits of projects, and they're stuck in this linear foot for linear foot method, and when a state is in a position where they can still decide on what their regulatory framework is for setting up compensatory mitigation and that kind of thing. It's very important to be based on functions rather than just form, um, but also to have some kind of mechanism where you can still keep adjusting. And one thing that's also happened in North Carolina as a result is there's no longer any innovation left on these projects. Time and again, you'll see 15 or 20,000 feet of the same, you know, like sinuous type of channel that's put in, in a farmland area and there's no net ecological improvement from those projects and the free market is not given any room to come up with a more innovative solution that might look more like a holistic watershed scale to try improving some of these issues that you can't actually do sometimes in the channel. You can't change the hydrology very much, you can't change the water quality a whole lot. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to maybe elaborate on that at no, all. No, I mean, just talked about it, but um, yeah, two things on that. W once the policy is set on what the success criteria are, um, then that is an, usually in existence for about five to eight years in these different states, and that is um, streams will be designed to what the success criteria say. If the success criteria are, say, these are the things that we're looking for, designers will teach to the test. They will make sure they will make sure that the design meets that. If the designs are, if the success criteria are more rigorous, the designers come up with, with a way to, to, to meet those. Um, and so what Jay is describing is essentially when the success criteria was a meandering stream with pool riffle sequence, the mitigation bankers were able to generate an enormous quantity of those. Um, so they baked a lot of loaves of bread that all looked the same because that's what was being judged by the interagency review team for success or failure. Um, and so once a success criteria in place, the market will create a lot of it. Um, so just that's, that's what the market does. Um, so we are going to leave, but I'm leaving behind Jay Singh, who has been down in the weeds with me um, in the southeast U.S. on compensatory mitigation. Um, he spent too much time with me. He's now cynical. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe the California sunshine will uh, make him more optimistic. So he'll be here in California. All right. So um, I want to leave you with one last provocative thought. Uh, those of you who work in basin plan, uh, water board uh, language, um, have you ever thought about the fact that when a mitigation project occurs, a basin plan is being amended? We're losing a, a reach of stream in exchange for something somewhere else. Um, there is usually a public process associated with amending basin plans and allowing participation in that decision-making process. So one more um, disincentive, if you ask me, for the last option. So I want to have you thank all of the speakers, uh, or the speakers, the real speakers. So Dr. Doug Shields and Dr. Martin Doyle, thank you very much. And thank you, Chris, for uh, bringing them here today. And then thank you, everyone, for coming today. So thanks. <laughs>